Ladies and gentlemen, uh, it's, a, uh, it's, a, it's a big Democrat time down in Springfield, which means it's a big challenge to keep the loyal opposition flames lit. And it falls on our friend Tom Cross over in the House and uh, the young lady you're about to hear from here, who has uh, in her office uh, constructed and begun to present to the state of Illinois a very serious, somber, and indeed sober alternative for how we look at the kind of endemic budget problems with which all of us are so familiar. So um, it's not her first time here, and we're delighted to say we know it is not going to be her last time here. Let's give a warm City Club welcome to Chris Redonio. Thank you. I'm um, particularly honored to have the uh, current and the former Senate President here. I'd like to think that maybe the future Senate President here, is here as well. So, uh, <laughs> but uh, I really am honored that they're here. It's great to speak in front of this group. Um, you know, I know that there are many distinguished members of the community here, and I know that because I want you to know I have read the book. That weighty tome called The History of the City Club. So I do know that you are the enlightened people of the city here to hear enlightened discussion on fascinating topics. And so I'm here today to talk about what's going on in Springfield. That's not always enlightened. Um, however, I do think it's fascinating for at least the policy wonk and all of us. But most importantly, what's going on in Springfield is very, very critical to our state's future, needless to say. And I have to tell you that lately, I actually think there's been a little bit of encouraging activity as we try to solve some of the state's financial problems. And as you know, my view is that it is all about the finances. All policy stems from the finances. That's what we need to be working on. People are actually talking to each other, both sides of the aisle and both chambers. They're actually communicating and sharing information. That's a good thing. This discussion is, going to, is starting at a point, um, and I'm hoping that we can expand it to include a discussion of how the decisions that we make today will affect us long into the future. In my opinion, for way too long, the financial discussion in the state capital is focused on the adjournment deadline. Are we going to go into overtime? Are we going to get out at the all-time all record of April 15th or whatever it was? But we're, it's all around the short term, um, resolving the predicament du jour um, with some sort of quick fix. And what we do is we end up lurching from one crisis to the next. It's a pattern that I think has led the state into the problem that we're in. And I would like to change that pattern. And when it comes to our finances, all of us plan in our personal lives. At least we try to do that. We think about college. We think about weddings. We think about retirement. Other governments, not so much the federal government, but other governments do also do some long-term planning. I know when I was on a village board, we always had a five-year plan, and other local units of government do that. Businesses plan for the future more than just a year out. Yet Illinois struggles with an endless state of emergency that pretends like the next fiscal year is never going to happen. Sometimes even the second half of the current fiscal year is ignored. But we've seen plenty of evidence that decisions that are made in the short term for political or economic gain don't work very well. We've seen bloated spending that cows house to special interests in order sometimes just to get some votes for the next election, but it exceeds available revenue and that's a problem. We've seen government programs that ignore efficiencies and borrowing plans that push debt onto our grandchildren. The long-term public employee union contracts that have resulted in average 7% raises for the last five years when most taxpayers have struggled are a problem. And again, I think we saw some short-term political gain with some of that. And then, of course, we have the massive tax hike that doesn't even fix the state's budget problems. So it was that 67% tax hike that spurred me and my caucus to really step back and say, what's going on here? For years, we had been warning that the budget cliff we're now on was coming. So we worked hard to try to rein in spending. We fought against job-killing tax hikes. We tried to push to improve the jobs climate. But I can honestly say 
that the 67% tax increase, and I do have to remind everyone it was a Democrat tax increase passed at 2 a.m. at the end of a lame duck session. But that was the one that sent us over the, over the top. And when you look at that and where we're at now, the result is really damning. Despite that tax increase, under the governor's budget plan, and I'm going to talk about some others in a minute, but under the governor's budget plan, Illinois is on a path that will lead to deeper budget deficits and higher taxes. If you look just five years down the road, when the so-called temporary income tax is scheduled to come off, using the governor's own numbers, Illinois will have an operating budget deficit of $22 billion. So what will happen then? Obviously, the tax increase will have to be permanent, and just as likely, it will require another tax increase, again in just five years. Businesses, once again, will end up being the piggy bank for out-of-control government spending, and our jobs climate will continue to suffer. Despite the tax increase, the governor and some others as well want to borrow another $8 billion on top of the $14 billion that's already been borrowed in the last few years. Now, Illinois pension and bond debt has grown from $54 billion in just 2003 to $119 billion today. That equates to $9,300 for every man, woman, and child in this state that has to be paid back. It's that borrowing that masks the state's true financial condition and the out-of-control spending because it supports a level we cannot afford. So despite that tax increase, Illinois will soon be in worse financial shape and face a crisis that threatens our most basic functions of state government. Now that's when our caucus did offer an alternative. Our plan included measures to support job creators, and one of them is being talked about a lot right now, and that's real workers' comp reform. But it also includes some pretty significant spending cuts. No one likes to talk a lot about spending cuts because they really do impact people. But we really believe that we can actually change the trajectory of our state's government's finances if we can make some significant cuts today. Our, our plan for the state of Illinois, instead of choosing a path that gets us to a $22 billion deficit in five years, puts us on a path to prosperity and a $4 billion balance in that five years, at which time we could start to reinvest in some of the critical services. It's just simple math. Our comprehensive financial plan cuts spending now, it pays our bills, it rolls back the tax increase that shouldn't have probably been passed in the first place if we had avoided going into the financial abyss we had been warning about. By stabilizing our state's finances, we'll be able to grow jobs because Illinois will lo no longer be a place where employers have to constantly fear the proverbial other shoe going to drop. Obviously, we just set a reminder of that mentality when Caterpillar, I think, warned us that we're going down a road with higher taxes and a bad climate that's not conducive to business. Hopefully, we'll be able to work with them and retain them in this state. What we've done is we offered a menu of $6.75 billion in cuts, and they are specific, and we are willing to put at least one half the votes necessary to pass those cuts. And if you'd like to view a complete list of those cuts, it's on a website, IllinoisRealityCheck.org. But what, out of the $6.75 billion, we need five to make our plan work. Five billion this year. Then we allow spending to grow by a modest 1.5% a year, not the 2% in the governor's proposal or in the spending cap bill that the Democrats passed. That one has a 2% increase built in. <clears throat> Some of the cuts will be very, very difficult. There's no question about that. But some of them won't be. I mean, we identified simple things like cutting taxpayer cell phones in half, taking the East St. Louis Finance Authority out of the budget, taking, taking um, take-home cars out, cutting, reducing those by half. But to achieve any real savings, Illinois taxpayers are going to have to look at a lot of difficult things. Nothing can be sacrosanct. We have to look at education. Human services, although we do this proportionately, and human services had already taken a number of cuts. We have to have more pension reform. We have to make state government more efficient in every area. And we have to have real cuts, not just skip paying the bills and saying that was a cut. Now, some people have said this can't be done. In fact, from my colleague, Senate President Cullerton, I've heard about the three C's, contracts, the Constitution, and consent decrees that they block our, our path to prosperity. 
Well, actually, when I hear that, it kind of sounds to me like that means the lawyers are the problem. And I don't want to go there too far because I'm married to one. But it does make me think that we have to take on these tough challenges and fight to get things done that are right because there simply is no alternative. If we don't do this, taxes will just continue to rise and depress our economy even more. Interestingly, interestingly today there was a report that came out that talked about tax day put out by the National Taxpayer Foundation. Tax Freedom Day in Illinois is now April 15th. It's, it's been pushed back three days from just last year. Now compare that to Tax Free Day in Michigan, which is April 7th, Indiana, April 5th, Missouri, April 4th. So this is clearly having an impact on, um, on what happens to the citizens in this state. Now we've presented a comprehensive plan to spark bipartisan discussion that has to take place in order to get Illinois back on track. And remember, I said at the beginning, I said that there was some real discussion taking place, and that is good. The House and the Senate Democrats have also proposed spending less than the governor, thus avoiding the $22 billion problem that we've identified in 2016. We've seen those numbers, and they've been discussed in the media. Now the real challenge though is to take every one of those scenarios out for five years and see what happens. Now let's look at the Senate Democrats estimate for next year. They estimate 34.5 billion in revenue and the good news is that's about a billion less than the governor so we are clearly moving in the right direction. But if they spend that in increased spending by just 2% a year over the next four years, they'll end with a $12 billion hole in fiscal year 16 if the income tax is temporary, as promised. But if the income tax is permanent, the deficit is still about $8 billion. So we're not a whole lot better off even with that proposed reduction. Now the House is a little bit more conservative. They are estimating <coughs> revenues of $33.2 billion, so they're close to $2 billion less than the governor. The House committees are now working to enact cuts that will spend no more than that $33.2 billion. But take that out to 2016 and assume the same 2% growth, and even that plan ends with us being $2 billion in the hole if the tax is permanent and $6 billion in the hole if it's temporary. In other words, neither the House or the Senate Dem plan fixes the problems when you do a little long-range planning. Now, both of them are headed down the path of not only making the income tax permanent, but sliding us back into chronic deficit position. The good news is everyone appears to be trying to reduce spending, and people are talking, but clearly we're not yet moving to that permanent solution. In my view, though, some things have to be off the table, and that's higher taxes, more borrowing that just masks spending increases, inflated revenue estimates that rationalize more spending, and phony cuts that just defer bills. Short-term solutions that don't address the problem. Now some people will be reluctant to take a long, hard look necessary to see a few years down the road. We can't allow that to happen. When politicians tell you, I've got the solution this time, you have to ask them, how long will it last? Because if we don't take that long-term approach now in Illinois, Illinois will continue to lurch from economic crisis to economic crisis. So while I do think it is very encouraging that the people in our state capital are talking, we have to be sure that they're also listening. And they need to be listening to the job creators who need stability and predictability, and importantly, to the taxpayers. So thank you very much, and I would be happy to try to answer any questions that you might have. Jenny and Kev, raise your hand if you have a question. All of them. Remember, there's nothing wrong with brevity. There you go. Well, you have the shortest question, Rich, so you get the first bite. Got okay. kind of some rules. Please address Governor Quinn's workers' compensation reform proposals and whether they go far enough. 
I would be happy to do that. As I said, that's one of the things that is um, very current in Springfield right now. Um, we've known for some time that workers' comp is a problem in this state. We are far out of step with the states surrounding us. Our costs are much, much higher. The scandal that's occurred at Menard Prison has really um, highlighted that issue. When you think about it, workers' comp costs for the state of Illinois are $150 million, and for the city of Chicago, $62 million. So this is a big issue, not only for business, but for government as well. I think that um, we're, we're having some discussions. I think some real reform will happen. I think the sticking point is there's a couple of issues that the business community and I think governments should like to see happen, and that is some standard of causation. Um, it doesn't have to be 50%, but some requirement that a worker link the workplace incident to the treatment that he will get. So for example, if you're just lucky enough to have your heart attack at work, your employer's not on the hook for that. That's just wrong. And I think we can come to some, um, some, hopefully, some agreement there and make that be part of the plan. The other issue is a standard for disability so that there's some rationality introduced into that system. I think there will have to be cuts to the medical fee schedule. It's extraordinarily generous, and I think if we balance these other areas with a cut to the medical fee schedule, we can get to a really good product, and I look forward to continuing to work with everyone on it. Again, it's important to business, but also to the government. Okay. The question is from uh, former Alderman Nataris. Would you favor a former Richard Nixon program federal state revenue sharing return to Illinois a percentage of the federal income tax Illinois sends to Washington? Um, you know, that's an interesting idea, and we had a chance to talk about it a little before um, I spoke. The problem is I don't think at this point the federal government is a, in a position to start spending money back to the states. In my view, every level of government needs to get their own house in order, and then maybe we can start talking about um, how we might share or do things better. But I, I just don't foresee a scenario right now that the federal government's in a position to do that. Save this question. Save it. <laughs> What a closer. All right. Uh, I'll go on a rant and I don't want to do it. Okay, here we go. Bill Seats, where are you, Bill? You ran up here? There he is. As you, that's a good question. As you pointed out, Democrats have argued that many of the cuts proposed violate the C's, contracts, consent, and the con decrees in the Constitution. True or not true? If true, how do you propose to get around these limitations? Well, let's take them one at a time. Contracts. Um, contracts can and have been reopened. The governor actually reopened the AFSCME contract not too long ago. He could do it again. Um, I've heard of local governments where the police officers and um, others have said, hey, I am willing to reopen that contract and forget that raise that was promised to me in better economic times because I'd rather not lay off the guy working next to me. This is important because when you sit through the appropriations hearings, and, and Matt Murphy can attest to this, when we hear about human service cuts that exactly equal the 8% AFSCME raises so that we're paying people more and delivering less service at a time when inflation simply hasn't been a factor, that's a real problem. And I think that we should insist that those contracts be reopened. Now, with respect to the constitutional issue on pensions, um, I think there's a lot of good discussion going on as to whether or not that can be done or how it should be done, what elements of the pension might be available. for. So, for example, the um, COLA, which has not actually yet been earned, is a future benefit. Is that something that could be on the table? We need to discuss it, but what we can't do is just say, gee whiz, that's too hard, never mind, we're not doing it. We owe it to the people in this state to make sure that we've explored it thoroughly, and if it means, and it probably will, that at some point we go to court, that's the right thing to do, and I think we have to do it. Um, consent decrees, um, again, I think these are things that, that's a, a process, there has to be a mutual discussion if it, we need to revisit it, but just to take things off the table and say, sorry, that's too hard, is not an acceptable option, not just for us, but for our children and for our grandchildren and what we're going to be leaving them. Okay. A lot of good policy issues. This is from Peter Benzinger, slightly less policy. Peter, where are you? Raise your hand. There he is, right back there, former VP of the City Club. Deals with redistricting. Any of you guys interested in that? Uh, <laughs> Jim, didn't we discuss that you may be my state rep and I live along the lake? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> 
Dilbert, you may be in Iowa. Okay. <laughs> Redistricting. The legislature is now holding hearings. Why not do that after the proposed map is drawn so the public really has a chance to give feedback? First of all, my suspicion is that map may be drawn, but um, I think that we should have hearings after the map has been made public as well. I mean, it's important to have hearings, get people's thoughts about what they want to see happen, but once it's actually unveiled, we ought to give people an opportunity to respond to that. I'm not so sure that's off the table, so um, hopefully it will not be and we will have a chance to do that. Uh, Lou Sandoval. The proverbial one-two punch for business in Illinois was the, income, was the increase in corporate tax rate and inability to carry business losses forward. What is your solution to alleviating this? Well, on those two particular items, in the plan that the Senate Republicans unveiled, we rolled both of those back before the time the tax increase is set to expire because we recognize that those are disincentives for business. And what you have to think about when you're looking at the entire picture is the reason we're so concerned about supporting business is they generate the wealth that actually supports the government. It doesn't work the other way around. So it's very important that we do whatever we can to encourage the development of private industry and private investment in this state and repealing those two things early. And the death tax was the other one we've decoupled from the federal government. Um, we'd like to see that rolled off earlier as well in an effort to spur business development. I think they're problematic. Uh, this is from George Van Jean from the village manager of Niles. Where are you, George? Right back there. You, you included an acronym here. I'm going to say it because I don't know what it means, but we'll just yeah. move on. Please summarize the debate over reducing the state income tax share to the LGDF. You think it's easy being a, a leader, huh? Obviously, this reduction would result in fewer employees and reduce services. For some of the uninformed, I know what it is. I'm just being modest. Why don't you ask, tell them what the LGDF stands for? LGDF is the Local Government Distributive Fund, and that is where the state shares with the municipalities a portion of the sales tax that is collected. Um, I think it's 10%. Uh, uh, so one of the proposals that we have is, while we work our way out of this crisis, to reduce that by 5%. I recognize that will be a hardship on municipalities. But a couple of things we could talk about doing are one of the things they'd like to see, which is direct deposit of their money. So while they may not get quite as much, at least temporarily, at least they know they would get it, which might mitigate somewhat the concern that they have. Um, so I think, again, it's something that we need to work together on. As I said, nothing can be sacrosanct. I mean, if we're talking about um, cutting funds for health care, and um, all kinds of other things, education, certainly local governments can participate with us as well. They've done a great job. This isn't their fault. But you know what? We're all pulling together for the same goal going forward. We all need to participate in the solution. Good answer. Now we'll give you the old softball, because we got three left, and you got to <laughs> mix them up, right, Chris? This is from Kent Griffiths, Griffiths from Wolf Point Strategy. Where are you, Kent? After you ask this question, you better keep your hand up. What, pri what priority do you have to end Chicago Democratic stranglehold in the city itself? This lady doesn't live in the city, but if you want to answer that, or you could just simply say Roebling's responsibility. It's an education process. Uh, you know what? I think that we uh, Republicans have a good message. I think it's one that's resonating across the country. We need good messengers. And we need to help people understand that they will benefit from balance in government. One party control, in my view, at any level, um, either party, is probably not the best thing. Normally, we don't read anonymous, but this one is a pretty good question. Thoughts, proposed action plan to regain or retain work rule changes impacting McCormick Place. You know, I'm still exploring what our options are. I will tell you that it was a very unfortunate ruling. There was a lot of, uh, talk about a success story, bipartisan cooperation, all recognizing the huge importance of McCormick Place to the city of Chicago, to the region, and to the state as a whole. It was a very satisfying process to actually get something accomplished and then see results. We actually had shows coming back 
and booking in Chicago. Um, this uncertainty, even again, if it turns out that it's overturned, uncertainty is the enemy of business, in, and I think we're going to take some lumps for it. So um, I don't have an answer as to exactly what we can do. Um, I will be talking with others that are more knowledgeable about what the options are, but I am committed to trying to see that we can retain shows here in Chicago. Uh, Phil, someday we might get merit selection of judges, but uh, who knows. All right, this one comes from, uh, well, Mr. Nataris, as a former alderman, you do have the benefit of a double hit. Uh, quick answer, would you support a casino for Chicago? I wouldn't rule it out, but it would depend on the details of the package. Hey, round of applause for that answer. <laughs> Even Rick Pearson might have liked that one. All right, the last question, and I will, you'll like this one, and I will not rant. How can the Chicago St. Louis High Speed Rail Project generate more job creating tech parks and stops along the way? This is from Leighton Olson. Where are you, Leighton? You own property in St. Louis? <laughs> For the record, I have never met anybody who wants to get to St. Louis faster. I just, I just, for the record. <laughs> what? You answer. Well, it just seems to me as a general matter of principle, um, any kind of good transportation is going to enhance the area right around it. And so if people are able to get somewhere easily and move goods, products, and people along, um, that would be a plus for those areas that are situated along that transportation corridor. How about a big round of applause?